Kiara already introduced me, but I'm going to talk about myself again, because I'm great. Um, my name is Lisa, um, and yeah, I'm a community manager at this really great company um, called Runaway in Dunedin, um, and I've been there for maybe just over two years now. I'm a designer as well, um, games editor, critic, <laughs> NZGDA board member, um, and I've given talks before, so I'm definitely qualified and you're going to learn heaps of stuff. Um, <laughs> Yeah, here's some logos, which are pretty pretty cool, if you recognize them. I don't know if they're going to come up. Yeah, there they go. Ooh, look at them. Cool. Qualification. <laughs> um, so I also, my talk was um, a bit shorter, so I was going to add some propaganda to come and work at Runaway, um, but I also realized we're a bit, um, running a bit close on time, but anyway, look at us go, we're really cute. Uh, we, play p we play video games and eat pizza together, um, celebrate Christmas, um, doesn't have to be Christmas if you don't like Christmas, um, and we do game jams as well, so um, we're probably going to be hiring very soon, so look out for that and come and live in Dunedin because it's great. Um, anyway, <laughs> so today I'm going to be speaking to you about friendship and how it is magic. Um, I'm going to be talking about how to create meaningful interactions um, in your game's design by applying themes of love and friendship and respect. And I'm going to be talking about the meaningful interactions through a linear design um, that focuses around a postmortem of how we design the friendship progression with this little cutie, um, Capybara, the Capybara. Um, that name came from a really silly typo that I laughed a lot at. Um, <laughs> So just to get an idea of the tone and the feel for Flutter VR, um, here is the trailer. Hopefully it plays. Yes. <laughs> kind of zen-like experience. Um, you basically are just hanging out in a rainforest for five days and making friends with all the creatures and learning about them and recording it in a journal. Um, so it's probably the best VR game ever created. Um, it's definitely the best mobile VR game for Google Daydream made in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> so we released Flutter VR uh, in December last year for the Google Daydream and like I said before, the game is broken into five days or play sessions um, where you can discover and document new butterfly species um, and also interact with the environment um, to sort of uncover hidden discoveries and secrets. There's things like feathers and footprints um, and these all get added to your trusty journal. Um, I'm not really sure what genre Flutter VR fits into, um, but it's definitely catering to, I guess, a particular type of niche audience who just wants to relax and escape to like a completely different environment. Um, it's a game about discovery rather than claiming. Um, it's observing rather than collection. And it's exploration rather than conquering. Uh, so Flutter VR <laughs> is a game with non-violent mechanics um, with a focus on love and nurturing. And this is something that is distinctly lacking in games um, where violent mechanics are kind of the norm. Um, this is what Flutter VR would look like if it was a first person shooter, maybe. <laughs> um, or this. <laughs> I didn't even make this, I just found it on the internet. It was like, amazing. <laughs> so I personally wouldn't want to play these. Um, I don't really enjoy games where I'm in stressful situations. Um, I like playing Zelda because I'm an adventurer saving a fantasy world and making heaps of cute and quirky friends. Um, I like playing Neko Atsumi because I'm making little cats happy. And I like playing Super Mario Odyssey because I'm solving puzzles through manipulating a world without it appearing to be like that harmful in any way. Um, and I like playing Skyrim because I have a crush on Lydia. Um, <laughs> and there's actually a term for these feelings that I experience when I play video games. And it's called Tend and Befriend. Who has heard of this? Oh, awesome. Great. I'm going to talk to you guys about it again. So sorry. <laughs> 
Um, but before I get into that, um, I wanted to ask, this is an interactive talk, um, <laughs> can you guys name me some games with non-violent mechanics? Go. Yeah. <laughs> nice, great, amazing. Keep going, keep going, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> great, you're all the best. Um, yeah, here's some examples. Um, I actually practiced this talk in front of a uh, game design class uh, at the University of Otago and they did not know many games <laughs> and <laughs> was very disappointing, so good work. <laughs> um, so all of these games are incredibly unique in their own way. They're extremely profitable, enjoyable and loved by players and fans. So there's obviously a want for these kinds of games. Um, so I just want to ask, why aren't we making more of these? Um, and this is all down to, I think, the tendon per frame reaction that um, some people have when playing games. Um, so this was popularised by a woman named Brie Coat, um, a previous lead programmer at Ubisoft, um, who's now a CEO of her own company, True Love Media. Um, so I'm going to be quoting from uh, her influential article, Slouching Towards Relevant Video Games. Has anyone read this? Great. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so she explains the varying feelings that people have when playing games. She explains that when you're playing a video game and there are a lot of flashing things on the screen, there's danger and it's shocking and it's fun, that's a fight or flight response. With fight or flight, your sympathetic nervous system kicks in and releases adrenaline followed by dopamine. If you like games like this, it's probably because the adrenaline and dopamine are very enjoyable. Um, your pupils dilate, your heart beats faster and your airways open up and you feel exhilarated, alive and powerful. But not everyone likes these kinds of games. I don't, my friends don't. They have a different response to stress. Um, she says that my friends and I don't like adrenaline, but there's something similar that's going on with us and it's called tend and befriend. Like fight or flight, tend and befriend is an automatic psychological reaction to threatening situations. If you experience tend and befriend, it's because your body releases oxytocin or vasopressin when you're stressed, followed by opioids, it's brain stuff. Um, <laughs> this calms your sympathetic nervous system so you don't get the flood of adrenaline. Um, instead of wanting to fight or flee, you stay relatively calm but aware. Your pupils dilate, you become fearless, and you are less sensitive to pain. You instinctively want to protect your loved ones, to seek out your allies and form new alliances. Oxytocin intensifies social feelings and opioids and feel extremely warm and lovely. Um, after reading this article, everything made complete sense to me. Um, and an example of this is a good snowman is hard to build. Has anyone played this game? It's great. This um, game is essentially um, a kind of puzzle game, but you have the option to hug the snowman. <laughs> and it's amazing. Um, and I also want to uh, illustrate this a bit more by using um, Fallout 4. It's a very relaxing game. Um, who's played Fallout 4? <laughs> yeah, sweet. Um, there's going to be major spoilers for Fallout 4, by the way, in this. Um, so I had this tendon befriend reaction in Fallout 4, but I didn't have a name for it. And this actually made me kind of like rage quit the game and just give up on it. Um, the reason that I enjoy Bethesda games is because of the character creation and the rich lore, um, but it's mostly the ability to romance characters. Um, so my goal <laughs> was to romance this guy. Um, his name's Maxon. He's the head of the Brotherhood of Steel. Um, and so I made sure that I partnered with uh, this guy, <laughs> Paladin Dance. Uh, I actually realized on my journey that I fell in love with him instead. Um, which actually worked out way better because you can't actually romance Max in any way. Um, uh, but then, so I'd gotten through the game, I had basically cut ties with any other faction, um, I was only loyal to the Brotherhood of Steel, um, and then you find out that uh, Paladin Dance is a synth and the Brotherhood of Steel hates synths, so I didn't know what to do, I either had to break up with my boyfriend or just kind of like live this like life of like living by myself with my boyfriend and dying because I don't have any factions to help me take out the boss. Um, and it was just absolute bullshit and I hated it. <laughs> um, I had gotten, yeah, I'd gotten rid of any other opportunity to do anything in the game. 
Um, so I was heartbroken and I was like, this game sucks, I hate it. Um, <laughs> I went on to like mess up the institution later on and it just wasn't as fun because I felt like um, everything was kind of pointless if I didn't have like my friend by my side. Um, companionship was the actual fun that I was having in this game, the working together. Um, so what is the lesson from this? I probably need more save files. Um, <laughs> Or you just pick the dog as the companion, because everybody loves dog meat. <laughs> um, what does this have to do with Flutavia? Good story. Um, everything, actually. Uh, so I kind of used the basis of Tend and Befriend to design uh, the progression of friendship with the capybara. Um, naturally, we assumed um, at the beginning of development that players would want to immediately become friends with this creature when they saw it. Um, and I kind of used like Firewatch um, as an example with this, with the turtle. Um, as soon as I found it, I was like, I want to keep it, I want to bring it back to my house and I want to bring it with it around with me all the time. Um, it's kind of just like the whole, you see something and you want to protect all the time. <laughs> um, so generally speaking, um, the instance is that you want to protect and befriend um, a kind of like, you know, a cute little animal. Um, but there is also, you know, the chance that people do occasionally want to manipulate with things because you want to test games. Um, and at the beginning in Flutter VR, we actually had uh, like items that you could pick up, like a knife, um, and people would just be walking around and play testing doing this. And I was like, we should get rid of that because they're going to try to do that to the capybara. <laughs> um, so we got rid of all of this. Um, and we also... Um, utilized uh, Jonas, who is our researcher, some of you probably know him. Um, he helped in choosing like a species that would work well for a progr uh, friendship progression mechanic, um, while still retaining kind of the natural um, behaviors of a capybara. Um, so we, I mean, we initially looked at creatures like sloths and ocelots and tamarins, like all the fun rainforest little dudes. Um, we were also gonna have a toucan, um, but it got cut due to time and resource. Um, so why did we pick the capybara? Um, they're cute. They're real cute. They're the world's largest rodent. They're underappreciated. Uh, I also exercised my newfound power in <laughs> becoming the narrative designer. Ooh, uh, and I demanded it, basically. Um, <laughs> so I'm using the same joke as Grace. Ugh, embarrassing. Um, <laughs> this is a picture of me at the start of Flood of VR development. Um, <laughs> This was my first ever project as a designer and writer. Um, and because this was my first project, I did a lot of hard research, like Googling capybara pictures. Um, I watched a really depressing documentary about capybaras and babies got eaten, it was bad. Um, <laughs> but in saying that, uh, it did help me kind of appreciate the little like nuances and silly things that we wanted to highlight um, in the game. Um, but before even designing the progression, I was like, what do I even, how do you even design a game? <laughs> um, so I looked at kind of my favorite games that had really good friendship progressions in them um, and took what I um, thought was uh, relevant to us and what they did really well. Um, so the first one is my favorite game of all time, which is Animal Crossing. Um, things that they do really, really well in this game um, is you know really good character design, um, they have like really rewarding and fun dialogue as well. Um, but the essential kind of friendship progression that you have with them is you basically just follow them until you, they love you. Um, you just kind of spam talking to them and like giving them gifts and that kind of thing. Um, but the other powerful, powerful thing um, that I wanted to apply to Flutter VR is that they stay in your village and they just go about your day and you get rewarded with like really cute animations like the dancing or just like watering plants and that kind of thing is really powerful. Um, so because Flood of VR is you know, a VR game, didn't really want to have much dialogue. <laughs> um, also didn't want to kind of uh, have that same sort of follow until they love you sort of thing, because like following a capybara would just run away and be like, leave me alone, please. <laughs> um, so yeah, what I took from Animal Crossing was just the staying in the environment and feeling safe with you. Um, the next one was um, The Sims. Sims 3 pets, specifically. Um, so, yeah, something that they do really well in here is the t attention to detail in the pets. Um, they also, you know, exhibit real-life behaviours like peeing inside and scratching up couches and 
doing what pets do, basically. Um, but it sort of has that same uh, interaction as Animal Crossing, where you just kind of spam to click um, to level up and sort of increase your friendship. Um, but another thing that I really liked from this is that they exhibited the real world um, behaviours that pets do. So I took that from that um, to apply to Flutter VR. Um, and then, yeah, Pokemon X and Y. Um, who's played that game? Great. <laughs> they have this really amazing feature called Pokemon Ami, um, which I love um, so much because this is something that you can actually pet your Pokemon in. Um, you can feed them, um, you can play with them, um, and all of this kind of like makes you feel closer to your Pokemon and is reflected um, in battle as well. So if you have like max friendship with your Pokemon, they'll like stick it out at one HP and be like, I didn't die because I love you so much. And it's like, oh yes, the best. Um, so yeah, the things that I really, really took away from this is that I was like, definitely have to feed the capybara in the game, no matter what. <laughs> also, um, definitely have to pet it, because uh, petting things is the best. Um, <laughs> and so these were kind of the core learnings that I took from these. I had like a huge design document where I just um, put all these games and put what I liked from them and how we were going to apply them to Flutter VR. Um, so yeah, these are all the main takeaways. Um, this here is a gif of a capybara popcorning. Um, this is a real life behavior that they do when they get really excited. They just kind of like jump around and wiggle and it's really cute. Um, so this was kind of like the animation reward that we put into the game. Um, and there was like a bunch of stuff like this um, that we added that I'm gonna show you now. If my videos work, if they don't, we'll just see how it goes. <laughs> um, so. The progression um, of Flutter VR is kind of broken into five days, play sessions. Um, so every day the player would have a different interaction with the capybara. Um, we also wanted this progression to be slower so that she didn't completely steal the show because the game is about butterflies, it's called Flutter VR, not Barbara VR. Um, and all of these are directly related to tend and befriend, um, to respect nature and highlight the real world uh, behaviours of the creature. Um, we also wanted to really put this into the narrative as like the narrative designer. Um, we have like a journal where there are journal entries that you can read, um, but we also wanted to kind of reflect this and the progression of friendship that you make with um, the capybara. So, you know, she acts as a source of comfort. She also um, acts as like this metaphor about relationships taking time, um, also that people need space. <laughs> and it's okay to take time for yourself as well, which I think is kind of reflected um, and just playing a VR game itself, like taking time for yourself to just relax and chill out. Um, yes. <laughs> so this is a video of what uh, happens in day one. Um, the player sees her, clicks on her, and she's like, oh, I'm out of here. Uh, <laughs> Um, so this is kind of like a natural reaction that a wild animal would have. They saw this weird human that just had this stick being like, hello. Um, so, um, but what's important to note is that the player knows that there is a capybara here that they can interact with. Um, in terms of narrative, it kind of reflected like the player's hesitance of being in a new environment, but also the excitement. Um, and the progression for, for, for the first day was just presence, um, knowing that the capybara is there and aware of you. Um, when she runs off, she's like, if you can see her up in the hill, and she's like looking down at you, and it's really cute. Um, it's not very obvious as well, so um, like the player is, is not immediately aware of her presence, but if you see her up there, that's also really rewarding, just knowing that she's kind of watching you and sussing you out a bit and being like, what is this human doing in my house? <laughs> um, so for day two, um, she is slightly close to your camp, but she's still like, oh, I'm out of here. Um, this also actually unlocks a new area for the player, so it's kind of directly related to um, new areas being discovered without like having to hack with a machete or something like that. These are all um, natural progressions that the environment is changing without you. Um, and so for this one, um, the player can actually see her and you can actually take a photo of her before she kind of bursts off. Um, it's also kind of just like a curiosity thing, like, you know, she's 
she the player starts um, in her campsite and immediately sees the capybara, so you know that she's kind of a bit more comfortable with you if she's like hanging out near your camp. Um, so this is like the ultimate day when you get to feed her. Um, this mechanic is still a little janky um, and we're still kind of working on refining it. Um, but you see her here, she's trying to get the little fruit um, off the tree, but she can't because she's a stumpy little capybara. And so you use the controller to feed her. Um, they actually do this thing where they get up on their hind legs as well, which is really cute. Um, and then she does the popcorning and it's amazing. <laughs> um, so yeah, for this, for this day, um, she, after you feed her, she just kind of wanders around. She doesn't directly follow you, um, but she's much more comfortable. I mean, who wouldn't be comfortable if someone fed you, you know? It's ultimate kind of sign of love. Um, <laughs> um, in terms of progression as well, this is the first time that you have like direct um, interactivity with her. And this is actually um, one of the very little instances that you can manipulate the environment to. Um, and it also exhibits her showing the real world behavior. Um, this is a video of an actual capybara popcorn. Hang. Oh no, how do I play it? Damn it. <coughs> Wonder if, oh sad. I'm sorry everyone, the anticipation. <laughs> Just Google capybaras popcorning and it's amazing. <laughs> um, so day four is kind of like the metaphor of sadness. Um, it's finally raining in the rainforest, which is cool. Um, but essentially you start, capybara's like, what up, good morning, welcome. Today it's raining, sad, let's go and find some butterflies together. Um, so you follow her up this hill and she leads you to a new butterfly discovery, which is cool. It's like direct kind of game mechanic. Um, she's really slow as well, so you can kind of boost ahead of her. Um, and then you eventually follow her um, up to this hill area. Um, you can do it, you can buffer. I believe in you. Um, so she's hanging out, but then she gets spooked um, and she runs away again, because you know, obviously Capybara wouldn't want to hang out in an awful thunderstorm. Um, so this is kind of like uh, our metaphor for like loss. Um, you don't know where she's gone. You're just like, oh my God, I'm alone in this awful storm. Um, but then she appears at the end of the day when you sit down, and this is the first part where you get to pet her as well. I um, also forgot to mention before as well, um, the rainstorm kind of really kicks up and your whole entire camp gets destroyed. Um, so you have to go back up, fix them, clean up your camp, and you're just like, oh, sad, my life sucks, I'm going to sit down. Um, and then the rain stops, and then Barbara emerges, and you're like, yes, and then you get to pet her. Um, this was also something that we really had to iterate on a lot because um, it feels weird petting stuff in VR. <laughs> um, eventually we put the kind of love heart you know, feedback in and that made it feel a bit better. Um, but yeah, so that's day four. And then the final day, um, how can you, like what's better than petting a capybara, you know? Um, capybara babies! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> um, so yeah, this was also something that we really, really wanted to include in the game was babies, because they are so cute. They look like little jelly beans. Um, and you can also pet them, which is amazing. <laughs> um, so this was kind of the ultimate, uh, I guess, friendship um, moment that we wanted, um, which was her and the babies hanging out at the camp on the night of your last day. Um, it kind of shows that you're all friends now, and even though it's your last day, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna be okay without you, and you're gonna be okay without them. Um, so that's kind of like the penultimate, kind of max level sort of um, metaphor that we uh, made in the end. Um, also on day five, there's like a rainbow and there's like butterflies everywhere, and it's just like a magical time. Um, so. As well as like in-game stuff, we also um, pushed her as a marketing kind of thing. Um, bought a capybara plushie. We have a bunch in the office and they're really cute. Um, so we sent these to like press and influencers to kind of like build hype for the game. Um, and we also gave away like plushies to our um, core existing players who play our mobile games. Um, and I've, I mean, I was gonna say from the trailer, you can probably tell it's nice, but the trailer screwed up, but it's, <laughs> it's all very, you know, peaceful and lovely, and we've had really positive feedback from that. Um, I mean, it's kind of like, 
rude as hell to shit on a game as like wholesome as this um, but um, we just we had a lot of praise of how relaxing it is and how the interactions with capybara were you know really satisfying and really fun um, and just being in the environment was really great as well like a, our main kind of source of feedback was like um, kind of like um, this game is great, but I really wish it was longer. And it's like, oh, so do we, but it's mobile VR, so <laughs> don't want the device to explode. But um, we did. We have like recently um, added in a whole bunch of new content for a um, new update as well. So hopefully, people like that. Um, but in summary, I guess um, what I'm trying to get across mainly is that games really need to innovate um, to bring new design methodologies um, so that we can reach these wider audiences. If you're afraid. Um, that you know your game is like too relaxing and niche, it doesn't really matter because there's always going to be someone out there that wants to play that kind of thing. Um, and we've seen that from the feedback that we've gotten for Flutter VR. Um, and Tend and Befriend is just one example of how you know players can react when playing games. Um, I really encourage you to consider love and respect instead of violence and fighting. Or if you do have violence and fighting, just have like romance capabilities or like friendship kind of capabilities um, to balance that out. Um, and VR is also a really powerful medium for people to feel um, connected to these creatures. Like at Runaway, something that we really um, want to do is um, allow people to feel connected to nature when they can't actively do that themselves. Um, and VR is like a really, really powerful medium to do that, um, especially when you make eye contact with a capybara. It's like, whoa, hi. <laughs> um, so I really hope this inspires you. Um, <laughs> yeah, look at the guy. Um, <laughs> rodent friends. Um, I hope this uh, inspires you and challenges you to kind of consider the kinds of mechanics that you make in future games. And I really challenge you to think about different audiences when you're designing your games. You know, people like who are non-gamers or just elderly or, you know, people like your parents. Um, so please just go and make some games about love and thank you all so much for listening.